I tried to just downplay it and say, Mom, don't worry about that. That would never happen. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're looking at 20 times people left clues about their murderers. That is our biggest piece of evidence. It's her last words. There was no doubt that this document was authored by Susan. For this video, we're looking at murder victims who managed to leave behind a clue about the identity of their killer, whether intentional or not. We will be including cases that have yet to be solved, but excluding cases where there's debate over the authenticity of the clue. Which of these cases do you find the most fascinating? Let us know in the comments. Julie Jensen. 40-year-old Julie Jensen was a mother of two and a Port Authority worker when she was found dead in her Wisconsin home in 1998. Julie Jensen, a mother of two, was poisoned with antifreeze and then suffocated to death in her home in 1998. Her husband, Mark, quickly became the prime suspect after one of their neighbors produced a letter written by Jensen before her death. In the letter, Jensen claimed that she was afraid for her life due to her husband's suspicious behavior and that if she died, he was likely the perpetrator. Days before her murder, Julie wrote a letter saying if anything happened to her, police should question her husband. Mark was arrested and tried for his wife's murder, with the letter being part of the prosecution's primary evidence. He was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, a decision that was overturned twice on appeal. Wisconsin Supreme Court back in March ruled that Jensen deserves a new trial and a letter from his late wife cannot be used as evidence against him. L. Rajeshwar Singh. In January of 2006, 43 year old businessman L. Rajeshwar Singh was shot and killed in his home in Guwahati, a metropolitan city in India. According to his housemaid, Singh and his killer had gotten into a heated argument before he was shot four times and left for dead. Unbeknownst to the assailant, Singh was able to grab a pen and paper, on which he scribbled a name before meeting his unfortunate end. This name was considered a vital clue to the killer's identity, especially because it was also found in Singh's phone. Police later arrested a 28-year-old man named Balishwar Singh in connection with the crime. Sherry Jo Bates. In 1966, Sherry Jo Bates was an 18-year-old freshman at Riverside Community College in California. On the night of October 30th, she decided to visit the school library to study and never returned home. Bates's body was found early the next morning by a groundskeeper at the school. She had suffered multiple stab and slash wounds, with some inflicted on her face and neck. According to crime scene investigators, Bates seemed to have aggressively fought off her killer, scratching him in the process and breaking off his wristwatch. Hair strands and skin cells of the assailant were found on her hands and under her fingernails, respectively. Despite an abundance of evidence found at the scene, the case still remains unsolved. Edward Baldock. The town of Brisbane in Australia was shaken in 1989 by the bizarre murder of Edward Baldock. Baldock, a father of four, was returning home after a drunken night out when he was picked up by 24-year-old Tracy Wigington and three other women. Tracy Avril Wigington is accused of the murder of a middle-aged man, Edward Baldock. The group drove Baldock to a park where Wigington stabbed him multiple times, drank his blood and left him for dead. She said, this is the night. This is what we're going to do. I need the blood. I need it. I'm a vampire. Before his gruesome killing, Baldock had undressed and folded his clothes into a neat pile beside him. When his body was found, police made a discovery that quickly closed the case. Tucked far into one of Baldock's shoes was a bank card with Wigington's name on it. Nearby was a set of uh, tan shoes, and in one of those shoes was found a uh, Commonwealth Bank card in a yellow folder. She was swiftly arrested and pleaded guilty to the crime. Floyd Moore Jr. In 1986, Floyd Moore Jr. was a sheriff's deputy in Florida and a security guard at the Turtle Lake apartment complex where he resided. Moore Jr. was working on January 28th when he noticed a man he suspected had broken into the complex. He questioned the suspicious man and collected his ID, which he kept in his breast pocket. Just after midnight, Moore Jr. radioed in for backup, and when the responding officer arrived minutes later, he found the deputy in a pool of his own blood. The only clue police had was the ID in Moore Jr.'s breast pocket. They were able to trace it to the culprit, Walter Grant Kaiser, who was arrested later that same day. Grace Brown. It's especially tragic when a whirlwind romance turns deadly. 
That was the unfortunate case of Grace Brown, a factory worker who fell in love with her employer's nephew, Chester Gillette. When Brown found out she was pregnant in 1906, she pleaded with Gillette to marry her, even sending him multiple letters to that effect, but he kept stalling. Her friends were warning her that uh, he wasn't what he seemed to be, that he was something different. And I think that she had no experience with that type of person. And, and so she, she was seeing what she wanted to see rather than uh, what her friends were telling her. Eventually, he took her on a trip to the Adirondack Mountains in New York, where he killed her. Her body was found at the bottom of the Big Moose Lake, and Gillette quickly became a suspect. A short distance from the capsized boat, they found Grace's body. Brown's love letters, which showed the amount of pressure she had put on him to accept the pregnancy, helped in securing a murder conviction against Gillette. He was tried and convicted of first-degree murder. On March 30th, 1908, Chester Gillette died in the electric chair. Michelle McNeil. On April 11th, 2007, Michelle McNeil was found dead in her bathtub several days after undergoing plastic surgery. I was crawling in the bathtub. She is unconscious and underwater. Police initially ruled it an accident, but it soon became clear that her physician husband, Martin, had a hand in her death. Martin had pumped Michelle full of multiple unnecessary drugs, which allegedly caused the cardiac arrest that killed her. Before her unfortunate death, Michelle reportedly told her oldest daughter, Alexis, quote, if anything happens to me, make sure it was not your dad. That was something that, as soon as I found out my mother was dead, I, you know, I knew he killed her. Um, partially because of that statement. After Alexis and her siblings demanded a review of the case, the manner of death was changed and Martin was charged with first degree murder. He was convicted of the crime, but took his own life less than three years into his sentence. The shrieks of joy came the instant the guilty verdict was read. Martin McNeil's daughters sobbing while their father remained expressionless. Odin Lloyd. Odin Lloyd was a 27-year-old linebacker for the Boston Bandits, a semi-professional football team, when he was killed in 2013. But according to Lloyd's coach, Mike Branch, and others, somehow Hernandez and Lloyd had formed an unlikely relationship, united by the women in their lives. His murder and the subsequent trial became sensationalized when NFL superstar Aaron Hernandez was charged with the crime. The whole world was watching as the 23-year-old former tight end for the New England Patriots was charged with murder, allegedly orchestrating the execution-style killing of his friend. On the day he died, Lloyd was picked up from his house by Hernandez, and his younger sister, Shaquille Tebow, saw him get into the car. While on the move, Lloyd texted Tebow saying, quote, you saw who I'm with, following up later with, quote, NFL and, quote, just so you know. It's not exactly clear whether Lloyd sent this to alert his sister or to brag to her. Hence, it was ruled inadmissible during the trial. However, it likely played a part in Hernandez's indictment. Russ Steger. Russ Steger was a divorced high school baseball coach when he married Barbara Ford, a recent widow. Russ and Barbara Steger lived a storybook life. But all that changed in the early morning hours of February 1st, 1988. On the morning of February 1st, 1988, Barbara called police, saying that Russ's gun had accidentally discharged and killed him in his sleep. Police initially believed her, but Russ's first wife, JoLynn Snow, later recounted a disturbing tale that changed their minds. Before his death, Russ had complained bitterly to Snow about Barbara and seemed to be afraid for his life. JoLynn wrote a letter to police because Russ often confided in her. Russ told her that Barbara removed large sums of money from their bank account. He also left behind a tape recording in which he questioned his wife's actions and raised doubts over the accidental shooting of her first husband. Snow's testimony and the tape, which was played in court, were instrumental in convicting Barbara of Russ's murder. The tape was recorded just three days before Russ Steger's death. On the tape, he confided his belief that his wife, Barbara, was planning to kill him. Susan Powell. The last time Susan Powell was seen by anyone outside her immediate family was on December 6, 2009. When Susan Powell suddenly vanished in December 2009, all eyes turned to her husband, Josh, who eventually became the only person of interest, according to police. Before then, Powell lived with her husband, Joshua, and their two sons in Utah. 
According to journals Powell kept and testimonies from her friends, there was a lot of tension between the couple over Joshua's reckless behavior. Prior to her disappearance, Powell created a secret will in which she detailed her marital discord and expressed fear for her life. She wrote about how bad the marriage had become. She talked about a million dollar life insurance policy that Josh had taken out on her. And she told her boys she would never leave them. She even goes as far as to say, if I die, it may not be an accident. In 2012, before a case could be built against him, Joshua took his own life and those of his two sons. While no longer an active investigation, the case of Susan Powell is still officially listed as a, quote, disappearance, as her body has never been found. There are two overwhelming emotions out here this morning, deep, deep sadness and also anger, anger that these two little boys couldn't somehow be protected from their father, a man that so many people feared was a killer. Abigail Williams and Liberty German. On February 13, 2017, teenagers Abigail Williams and Liberty German went missing when hiking through Deer Creek Township, Indiana. Their bodies were found the next day, and while details have never been released, the police began a murder investigation. This is the bridge that we've all seen in the images released to the media. You can see now some flowers left behind in memory of the girls. One clue was found on German's phone. It was Libby who managed to take a cell phone picture of a strange man on the bridge. He's the prime suspect. While hiking, German had taken a photo of an unknown man walking towards the girls. Unfortunately, the picture is not clear, but police were quick to suspect this man as the murderer. An audio recording was also found on the phone, with a muffled male voice saying, quote, down the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. A sketch of the suspected killer was released in July of 2017, which was updated by police two years later. More than 50,000 tips have poured in over the years, but none of them have led to the elusive killer. Various persons of interest have been put forth, but the case remains frustratingly unsolved. Sebisile Happiness Cosa. When South African teacher Sebisile Happiness Cosa was discovered dead on a remote dirt road in 2015, the numbers 071 were found inscribed in the dirt near her burnt body. Police suspected this to be the beginning of a cell phone number, but Cosa had died before finishing. Koza's boyfriend, Siamam Kela Odwa Nampumza, became the leading suspect after his fingerprint was discovered on a petrol bottle found at the crime scene. It's suspected that Nampumza murdered Koza after growing jealous of her new boyfriend. However, Nampumza claims that he had nothing to do with Koza's murder. Simon Ng This teenager from Hong Kong was living in New York City when he began writing a blog. The blog was meant to detail his personal struggles of living in a new country. Instead, it led to the apprehension of his murderer. On May 12, 2005, Ng wrote that his sister's ex-boyfriend Jin Lin had entered his apartment, despite being asked to wake downstairs, supposedly to retrieve some fishing equipment, and that he was acting agitated. Simon and his sister were murdered soon after. Police searched Simon's computer and found the blog, pointing them towards Jin. He was subsequently arrested and sentenced to life in prison. Kathleen Weinstein. In 1996, special education teacher Kathleen Weinstein was murdered by a teenage carjacker. Give me the key! Come on! Okay, hurry okay, up! Okay, 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 get out! Unbeknownst to the teen, Weinstein was capturing the entire ordeal on a hidden tape recorder that she retrieved from a bag and hid in her coat pocket. Following the discovery of her body, authorities listened to the recording which contained key details like the carjacker's first name and age. The man, 17-year-old Michael Lassane, was later captured driving Weinstein's car, arrested and sentenced to life in prison. Following a successful appeal in 2007, Lassane was once again found guilty and resentenced to life. Sandra Deist. On March 29, 2000, Michigan man David Deist called 911 and reported that his wife Sandra had taken her own life. We didn't have any reason to dispute his story. And quite frankly, given his background, the fact that he appeared to be a stable, normal guy with a family and a good job and some community involvement and stuff, we basically gave him the benefit of the doubt. The story was widely accepted until Sandra's autopsy was conducted, which revealed that she'd been shot twice. Sandra's sister Mary also came forward with an incriminating note. Sandra had told Mary that if anything happened to her, a note hidden in her china cabinet would explain everything. For the first time, 
Sandy described what really happened in the horse stable 18 months earlier. The note stated that David had tried to kill Sandra with an axe hammer back in 1998. Further analysis of David's shirt revealed microscopic blood spatter, indicating it was David who had shot Sandra. Forensic professionals did the rest, and David was sentenced to life in prison for Sandra's murders and died there in 2018. After the verdict, relief from Sandy Deist's relatives, grief from David's side of the family. That it was a, a difficult thing for both families, and no one's a winner. Matthew Pike. British student Matthew Pike lived with his girlfriend, Joanna Witten, in Suffolk, England. Witten drew the attention of a man named David Heiss on a gaming website, and Heiss grew dangerously infatuated with Witten. Heiss proceeded to stalk both Witten and Pike, and in September 2008, he broke into Pike's apartment and fatally stabbed him in a fit of jealousy. A German computer game enthusiast, calling himself David Heiss, left a message on her Facebook page. The message said, you must be suffering unbelievable pain. I'm sorry for causing so much trouble lately. Pike was able to write the letters DAV in his own blood before dying of his injuries. Witten returned home to find her boyfriend dead, and Heiss was quickly arrested. He was subsequently sentenced to life in prison. Alexander Litvinenko. This Russian defector once worked for the Russian Federal Security Service before publicly accusing his superiors of ordering an assassination. The fitness fanatic was an outspoken critic of the Kremlin. He fled to the UK in 2000, where he was given political asylum. It's thought he then worked for MI6 and Spanish intelligence as an informer. He subsequently relocated to London and sought protection. While living in England, Litvinenko wrote two books and dropped numerous bombshells about the Russian government. In November 2006, he was poisoned and murdered by what's assumed to be members of the Federal Security Service. Litvinenko grew very sick after meeting prior colleagues, but was able to remember a particular pot of tea that only he drank from. The police later found this teapot, which contained high amounts of polonium-210. Alexander Litvinenko died in hospital the very same day. His hospital room was sealed. I've been a consultant for over 20 years. I've never seen a case like this, and I hope I never do again. Unfortunately, the primary suspect in the case, Russian politician Andrei Lugovoy, cannot be extradited from Russia. Sir, can you tell me, why did you murder Alexander Litvinenko? Interesting approach. This is the first time in my life that a question has been asked this aggressively. You should ask this question the Prime Minister of the UK and the Head of Intelligence Services of UK. Denise Amber Lee. On January 17, 2008, a man named Michael King abducted Denise Amber Lee from her own home. King took Lee to his house and assaulted her before taking her to his cousin's house. At 6.14 p.m., the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office received a bizarre 911 call from a cell phone from someone claiming to be Denise Lee, the missing person herself. How could that be? Lee managed to grab King's cell phone and called 911. The call lasted approximately six minutes and saw a panicked Denise providing various pieces of information to the authorities. Using her abductor's cell phone, everything she is saying is clearly for one purpose, so she can be found. Unfortunately, they were unable to save Lee, and she was murdered by King shortly after the call. The whole ordeal lasted seven hours, with Lee being kidnapped around 2 p.m. and King being arrested at 9.15 that night. Lee's 911 call aided the prosecution, and King was sentenced to death. Her father, Rick Goff, had one last message for Michael King. I just want to tell Michael King you're a coward. Um, you got what you deserve coming. And Denise was a lot better person than you, and she's going to put you in a place where you belong, which I believe is hell. And that's where you're going to be. Nadine Haig. The death of 33-year-old mother Nadine Haig in 2009 was made to look like she took her own life. The police bought it. But her family insisted there had been foul play. Investigating themselves, they found the words, quote, he did it on a note underneath her supposed note. These same words were later spotted etched into a bathroom tile. The family believes that the he in question is Nestore Guizan, the father of Haig's young daughter. 
The family collected enough convincing evidence to overturn the ruling on her death. However, Guizan denied involvement, and there's no direct evidence linking him to what happened to Haig, which means it remains an open case. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Amarjit Chowan In 2003, drug dealer William Hornsey kidnapped London businessman Amarjit Chowan, along with his wife, mother-in-law and two sons. Amarjit was a successful businessman and owned this freight company in Southall. He started it from scratch seven years ago. It now has an annual turnover of over four million pounds. Wanting to use Chowan's business as a front, Hornsey forced Chowan to sign it over, then killed the captives and dumped their bodies in the ocean. However, Chowan's body later washed up in Bournemouth, as did his wife's and mother-in-law's. Inside Chowan's sock was a note addressed to Hornsey's father, naming his murderer. And it's dated the 12th of February 2003, um, which clearly meant it arrived the day we believe Mr. Chohan was being held captive at Forge Close. Hornsey and his associates were quickly apprehended, and each received severe prison sentences for their roles in the Chowan family murders. 